this is Largo. He's my seven-year-old off the track thoroughbred. He retired in the beginning of September and I picked him up shortly after. He's transitioning from a track to hack. I cannot stress enough how much this has been a lifesaver. He'll literally <laughs> eat it out of my hands. Um, I did three weeks of ulcer shield. I then put him onto the gastro aid recovery for six weeks. Um, and then he's been on gastro aid every day ever since. Um, as you can see, he loves it. Um, he's typically quite a fussy eater. With this, he's gained weight, he's held his top line, he's just a thousand percent better in himself. You can tell how much it helps with the overall um, gut health. Um, everything from he, just his mannerism thing, girthed, um, just bridled, saddled, um, lunging, everything like that. He's just got a much better work ethic. He's so much more chilled out and relaxed. Um, he was quite stressy, he used to pace the paddocks. Um, and yeah, it was really awesome to hear after being a grade four out of five ulcer horse that he is completely ulcer free now. So I thank Kaleido very, very much. Hi guys, I'm Trish from Sunshine Coast Saddlery and I wanted to have a chat to you today about a product that we sell in store uh, and that we actually feed to our own horses at home. And that is Kaleido Gastroid. There's two products on the market. There's Recovery, which is targeted to for horses that are either have uh, ulcers, or are likely to get them, or are going through really high stress periods, and your everyday, which is a really great everyday gastric supplement, um, you know, particularly beneficial for, for for any horse, but for, for working horses and enduring the st extra stress that we put on them and their digestive system. Uh, so in regards to recovery, uh, look, money has been on the product, um, as, as have a lot of our other horses. The main no difference that we've noticed uh, is our feed conversion has gone up, uh, so we're feeding a lot less. Uh, and the horses, look they look great, um, their coats are really healthy, they're, they're not getting so many niggly issues. Um, obviously, gut health ties in with, with so many other bodily functions, uh, immunity, uh, how they process all of the things that we're feeding them um, so that their body can sort of fire on all cylinders. Uh, so talking about recovery, uh, we're talking about therapeutic levels of coating agents, pectins and lecithins, uh, pro and prebiotics, which are blocking your harmful gut bacteria, you're neutralizing stomach pH, um, and you're basically improving the uh, integrity of your, your stomach lining. Um, so look, it's we really rate the product. Uh, we have, as I said, a bunch of products, courses on the product. Um, and yeah, look, very, very happy with the results. So make sure you get in store and, and check out Kaleido Gastro Aid. He, he will eat the product right out of your hands, so, um, which I will show you, just to show you they love it. Um, <laughs> and look, you can actually see, uh, look how sticky that's getting as soon as just saliva hits it. So you can imagine what that's doing inside your horse's stomach. So, uh, look. If you are competing, if you you know you have an elderly horse or you have a horse who's not doing well, definitely check out GastroAid. Uh, very highly rate the product, um, and we've been very happy with the changes we've seen in our horses at home. Yeah, hi guys. Um, I have uh, recently started using this product, probably the last couple of months. Um, I think it's. I'm quite surprised how good it is actually. Um, you know, you get reps that come around all the time saying this about probably a thousand items, but I use this on uh, Meet Mr. Taylor. He was quite a light horse since he was, uh, since I put him on this, he put on good weight. And I've got quite a few other horses that were on uh, not doing so well. I've had them on uh, uh, Ulcer Guard, all those products. And since we moved to this product, uh, I'm quite surprised how well it works and I would strongly recommend it. I'm Maddie Grocourt and this is my dressage horse BZ Flynn. Uh, he's seven years old and I've had him since he was three and during that time he's um, unbeknownst to us he's actually suffered um, enteritis which is the, in the inflammation in the intestines um, and that's made him quite uncomfortable and to the point where he's been colicking three to four times every summer and um, we didn't know what it was and then eventually he got really sick and had to spend some time in um, Southeastern Hospital um, for a couple of weeks and um, found out what it was. And But I've been using the Gastro Aid Recovery on him and um, just to help um, line his stomach and repair it all from um, 
everything that was going on because he's got quite a sensitive stomach, thanks, but. Um, and then I've switched him over to the gastro aid every day just to keep, you know, just as a maintenance dose. Um, and like as a result of these Kaleido products, um, he's just, his whole demeanor's changed. He's um, so much more happy in himself and to ride and to just to handle on the ground as well. Because sometimes he could be a bit of a grump, but he's just so much more loving. And like his coat, like his coat's just changed completely. He's got this nice shine. And he's just, he's just, yeah, I couldn't thank the waiter enough for it, so. Hi, my name's Jess and this is my horse, Mac, and this is our Kaleido story. So when I first got Mac, he was really underweight. I didn't think anything of it at first because I knew he'd come from a racing background. However, after a few months of having him on full feed and not seeing any improvement in his condition, we started to think there might be some bigger issues at play. And that's when I started to look for a supplement um, to support his total gut health. Um, and I came across Kaleido Gastro Aid. After putting it um, Mac on, we'd seen such big improvements um, in his condition. He'd started putting on weight. He was much more willing to move um, off my leg under saddle. His coat started to get a bit shiny and he was also much more playful out in the paddock with the other horses, which was a really great sign that I was starting to get a happy and healthy horse. If you are combating gut health issues, Gastroid Recovery is the ultimate supplement targeting both foregut and hindgut health and aiding horses recovering from gastric ulcers. Gastroid Recovery is formulated for horses with gastric ulcers, those recovering from ulcers, or those who are under a significant amount of stress. For stomach health, Gastroid Recovery contains antacids, which help to neutralize or buffer stomach acid and reduce irritation to the stomach lining. Most importantly, Gastroid Recovery provides therapeutic levels of the coating agents pectin and lecithin, which form a gel-like layer over the stomach wall to protect it from acid burn and strengthen the mucosal lining. For hindgut health, the prebiotic binds to harmful bacteria within the gut. This helps to reduce the risk of disease and subsequent conditions such as diarrhea. The prebiotic also helps to enhance the horse's natural immune response to infection. And finally, the live yeast probiotic helps to stabilize hindgut pH levels and stimulates the growth of beneficial microbes in the hindgut. This helps to improve fiber digestion and enhances feed conversion efficiency. I have two dressage horses. Both of them showed symptoms of stomach ulcers, signs of stress, uh, chomping at the bit, lack of drive to go forward and a dull coat. We were given a sample of the gastro aid every day and then I decided to trial it on one of my horses. In about four weeks, noticed a big improvement in his attitude. He was a lot calmer, uh, not as stressy, I had a better coat and then I put my second horse onto it and he had the same change, he had a shiny coat, a lot more drive to go forward, a lot happier being in the stables. They're still both on Gastroaid every day, both looking fantastic, working fantastic, really happy and they love the taste and they eat all their feed straight away, really happy. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us again this evening and welcome to our newcomers. My name is Natalie and I am the technical manager and nutritionist for Kaleido Animal Health. We're super happy to be hosting the second webinar in our three-part exclusive webinar series on equine digestive health and disease with leading equine veterinarian, Dr. Associate Professor Dr. Ben Sykes. For those of you who weren't able to attend our last webinar, I'll give you a little background on Ben. Ben graduated from Murdoch University and went on to complete an in Following this, Ben undertook a residency in equine internal medicine in Virginia, USA, gaining his diplomat status in large animal internal medicine in 2004. He then spent seven years in Finland as head of the equine clinic at Helsinki University and in private practice. He was awarded his European diplomat status in equine internal medicine in 2011. 
Ben is an associate professor in equine internal medicine at Massey University and holds adjunct positions at the University of Queensland and the University of Liverpool for research and teaching respectively. Throughout his career, Ben has focused on high performance horses in racetrack, breeding and sport horse settings. He has a strong interest in clinical research, which has focused largely on gastrointestinal diseases of the horse, specifically equine gastric ulcer syndrome, also known as EGIS. Ben has many peer reviewed publications to his credit and was a lead author for the European College of Equine Internal Medicine consensus statement on equine gastric ulcer syndrome. Ben also maintains a strong interest in postgraduate education and has spoken at numerous conferences around the world on subjects relating to equine health. Outside of COVID, Ben spends most of his weekends carting kids around in a truck to either polo cross or three-day events. So again, this is a great opportunity to learn from the expert on EGIS. And during this session, we will focus on treatment, management, and prevention of squamous and glandular gastric disease. Just before we begin some housekeeping, Ben will talk for approximately 40 minutes, after which I'll have a little cameo to talk about some of Kaleido's nutritional solutions. After that, we will have a short 10 minute break, followed by 15 minutes for Q&A. There is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, so feel free to ask questions uh, throughout the talk, uh, but we will wait until the Q&A session to answer your questions. And with that, I'll pass over to Ben. Thank you. Excellent, thanks Nat, and uh, thanks to everyone for coming along, and thanks to Collado for putting it on. So we're going to keep going today, uh, pick up from where we were a couple of weeks ago and focus on updating some of our current thinking of equine gastric ulcer syndrome. So just to get started, my affiliations, I'm an associate professor at Massey University. I have adjunct positions at Queensland and Liverpool, and I've done work for a range of pharmaceutical companies and uh, people in the sphere of gastrointestinal health. Uh, in including Collado in terms of consultancy. I'll tell you maybe a little bit more about that later. So what we're going to do today is we're going to review a little bit of uh, what we did in the last session just to make sure it's fresh in our minds and also for people that might be new to the conversation. We're going to focus on the terminology. And we're going to focus on the risk factors and the management. And we're going to spend most of the talk today talking about the prevention of EGIS. Uh, we'll do a little bit on treatment, but a lot of it's going to be on prevention. And what we're going to really try and do is see if we can answer the question, can we manage the performance horse? Can we manage the performance horse um, for, or safely in terms of EGIS? Can we, can we still get what we need out of a horse that either has a history of ulcers or where we're worried about ulcers? And looking at ways that we can do that in a safe and effective way. So to review the terminology again, uh, EGIS is actually an umbrella term, it's not a specific diagnosis and really what we're now talking about is equine squamous gastric disease which is approximately the top half of the stomach and this is the best understood and described of the two syndromes and it goes back to us originally having quite short gastroscopes and we went in and looked at the horse's stomach, this would be what we could see which is the white and yellow area here of the horse's stomach. More recently we've started to recognise over the last sort of five to ten years that we also see quite significant disease in the, in the glandular mucosa. And in the glandular mucosa, uh, pri primarily we see these lesions at the pylorus, which is the outflow of that stomach into the small intestine. This disease is much less well understood and much less well described. We're starting to get a reasonable number of publications in terms of what sorts of populations are affected. And we're getting some information on what sort of risk factors might be involved and we've got some information on treatment that we're going to touch on now, but we don't really understand why this disease occurs. And it's an area that we're doing a lot of active research on at the moment. So it's important that we understand the differences between those two, um, the different locations, they affect different populations. They have different causes, um, both uh, in terms of epidemiologically and risk factors and also the specific disease process. And they respond very differently to treatment. And when we want to prevent them, we prevent them differently. We have very different strategies 
for managing glandular gastric disease than we do for squamous gastric disease. The critical thing is they're not related. They just happen to share the same room, um, the same way you know, as the odd couple. So they just happen to share the same anatomical structure in the horse's stomach, but they're not actually related to each other. And that's really important because what we know about one, we can't extrapolate to the other and say, well, this is how we prevent squamous disease. This is how we're gonna prevent glandular disease. They're entirely different creatures and we need to treat them as such in the way that we approach their management. So very quickly, squamous disease is primarily a management associated disease. And if we look at what we have here, we have lesions across from a normal stomach on the left with this nice sort of white looking mucosa, the pink bits are glandular mucosa down there. And as we come across to the left, we see a progression from relatively mild to some very, very severe lesions on the right hand side. The cause of this is really quite straightforward. In the normal horse's stomach, we have a mat of food like we see on the right. So if we were to look into a normal horse's stomach with a gastroscope, that's what we see if the horse has been eating. And what that does is that provides stratification of the acid in the stomach. So we have bicarbonate coming in through the esophagus and that sort of collects at the top. And we have stomach acid being produced at the bottom of the stomach and that collects at the bottom. And what this feed does is physically stops those two from mixing with each other and has this sort of allows this slow orderly progression as the stomach, as the food progresses through the stomach from a neutral pH area down to an area with an extremely acidic pH of around one to two. Factors that affect that and factors that change that process, are obviously the presence of roughage is a really critical element and we're gonna come back and talk about that repeatedly when we talk about management. But exercise is the other big factor and exercise is a very important factor. And what's critical to recognize about exercise is that if we look at this graph on the left is what we see is that we've got horses that are exercising on a treadmill here and they're looking at the pH in the proximal part of the stomach where the squamous mucosa is. And you see it ticks along nicely at seven, at seven, seven. The horse starts walking, it drops down a little bit to six, but that's okay. And then the moment the horse starts trotting, that pH drops down dramatically to about one to two. So the moment the horse starts trotting, we see that highly acidic acid content starting to splash up onto the squamous mucosa. And there's no difference if we look at this horse from trotting to galloping, back to trotting and back to a walk as it rests down, we see no difference as it goes through those different phases of, of exercise. So it's in terms of stomach health, in terms of the, the risk of squamous disease, galloping or cantering is no greater risk than trotting. And it's that change from walk to trot that's really important. And what it leads to is effectively this splashing of acid going up onto the squamous mucosa into an area that's fundamentally not designed to tolerate acid. So diet does play a role. We've talked, we're gonna to touch on roughage again and again. High carbohydrate diets play a role. We know that a pH of less than four, they worsen hydrochloric uh, acid injury and hydrochloric acid being the gastric acid that's produced by the horse. But it's really important to recognize, we're going to talk about this, that grain and processed feeds are not the devil. They, they've been really demonized in the discussion about gastric ulcers. And it's, it's really quite unfair, but it's also uh, incomplete. If we only think about managing grain and we don't think about other factors, then we're not going to get the kind of outcomes that we want for our individual horses. And we can counteract a lot of what we get uh, a lot of the, the side effects of grain and commercial processed feeds by having appropriate roughage, um, by limiting the quantity of soluble carbohydrate. And, and it's important because a lot of the original studies used very, very la large loads of carbohydrate to prove that you can do it with, with, you know, the volatile fatty acids make things worse, but they're far in excess of what we would ever feed a, at least a sport horse um, or a performance horse. It's a little bit different in the racehorse world because those horses do eat extremely high carbohydrate diets. And that's one of the major factors in why those horses have such high rates of squamous gastric disease. And we're gonna talk about the role of timing of feeding and how we can influence these factors to minimize our risk. So pretty simply, we looked at this last time, as you move across the right of the screen, the harder you work, the more carbohydrate they eat, you eat, the higher intensity lifestyle you live, the more likely you are to have squamous gastric disease. If we look at the literature, there's a whole bunch of other factors described, like the sex of the horse, the age of the horse, a bunch of other things, but they're nowhere near as important as these dominant factors of diet and exercise. And, and that's what we're gonna focus on today. A lot of those aren't things that we can't change, right? We can't change the age of the horse and the sex of the horse anyway. So we should focus on the things that we can change. And it's this splashing that we can change. 
Very briefly on glandular gastric disease, this involves uh, hyperemic erosive ulcerative disease of the horse's stomach. It's actually quite rare that we have truly ulcers in the glandular mucosa. So we tend to term this gastric disease rather than gastric ulceration. If we look across from left to right, we can see a nice normal pink pylorus mucosa on the left hand side, a quite red one and then we get all the way across to the right to a couple of very severe lesions. The lesion on the very right is an extreme form. The lesion second from the right is a relatively common finding, particularly in the warm blood sport horse population. We tend to see these very specific types of lesions in, in our riding horse population, warm bloods and thoroughbreds and, and riding breeds in general. So, uh, it's much less well described this, um, but what we do know is it's inappropriate to extrapolate what we know from squamous disease across to glandular disease. And if we do so, the problem with doing it is it gives us a false sense of security. So we have a horse that we're concerned is at risk of aegis, and we do all the right things on the basis of squamous disease, but it may actually not change our, or will not change our risk of glandular disease, at least not directly. And so we need to think about specific management strategies for both of them and manage them both simultaneously. And that's what we're going to focus on today for the rest of the talk. There's no effective age and there's nothing to suggest diet plays any role in glandular gastric disease. So diet's a really important factor in squamous disease and has minimal if anything to do with glandular gastric disease, certainly not as a major driving factor. Uh, the other important thing about glandular gastric disease is that we see it far more commonly in our sport horse population. So our squamous disease is really primarily disease of racehorses and endurance horses. And we'll, we've touched on that already and we'll look at that in more detail in a second. But we see glandular disease in a very different population. We see glandular disease much more commonly in the riding horse and the sport horse population. And so it's probably a lot more relevant to a lot of people sitting in our group here who have those types of horses. Uh, what are the risk factors? Uh, so basically there's a couple of studies that show we don't know too many risk factors, but we do know that exercise is a risk factor, not the duration of exercise, but the number of days per week. So in this study, what we saw was exercise in six or more days a week, increased the risk of disease of having glandular gastric disease three and a half fold. And when we did a similar study in racehorses in Australia and the UK, we saw that exercise in five to seven days a week those horses were 10 times more likely to have glandular disease than horses that exercise four or less, even when we corrected for other factors like time in work, trainer, diet, and all these other factors that potentially would be involved. So the number of days the horse exercises per week is a really critical risk factor in the determinant of glandular disease, or more specifically, what it appears to be is that we need to build rest days into our horses' schedules to ensure, from a stomach point of view at least, to reduce their risk of glandular gastric disease. Stress is the other big factor in glandular gastric disease. There's minimal evidence to say that stress plays a role in squamous gastric disease, but we're getting a growing body of evidence that behavioral stress and behavioral stresses are central to the disease process of glandular gastric disease. What's stress for a horse? We're not really sure, um, but you know, there's a lot of behavioral aspects and a lot of welfare aspects that we need to really start thinking about the modern management of our horses uh, isolating horses from each other, not allowing them to engage in natural grooming behavior, these sorts of things, as well as the more obvious things such as transport and um, competition and those sorts of things. It's not just, um, it's not just the, the big things, it's those little day-to-day -day things that are probably very important as well. And the freedom to express natural behavior is something that I personally believe is very, very important for all horses to have available to them. So what are our take home messages before we move on? Well, simply what we learn, learn about squamous disease, we can't translate to glandular disease. Squamous disease is primarily a disease of domestication and intensive management, whereas glandular disease has a little bit of that involved, but it's a, it's a, a very different disease. And what it means is that we see glandular disease in populations that we would normally consider at low risk of ulcers. We you know, traditionally would say, oh, that horse is not gonna have ulcers because it's getting lots of hay and it's doing this and it's not exercising hard it's not gonna have ulcers. That's changed now uh, because what we see very clearly is that there is A, a breed predilection, particularly for warm bloods. Being a warm blood's the single biggest risk for glandular disease that we've identified. Um, but also these other factors that go on in their life, such as uh, the way they're ridden and these sorts of things that create this sort of uh, behavioral stress environment. Thoroughbreds probably sit somewhere at both ends of the spectrum. We've probably got the very laid back thoroughbreds that doesn't matter, 
But those highly strung thoroughbreds that behave in many ways like warm bloods, they're probably in the same category as warm bloods for risk. We just haven't been able to prove it um, in studies yet. Most importantly, as we've touched on and we'll keep touching on, it's not a disease of diet. So how do we reduce the risk and have a performance horse? This is what we do on weekends. This is what my family does. These are my two, two of my kids riding out on the eventing circuit. Um, I don't have any pictures of me riding polo cross, but really it's all about the kids anyway, uh, with Bubbles and George here doing what they do. So how can we get Bubbles and George in good condition, in good, you know, well-fed, doing what we want them to do, recovering well, and re competing week after week without compromising their gastrointestinal health or without causing them to have an unnecessary risk of aegis. And that's the focus of where we're going to go from now. So the way I like to look at this is I like to think of this as the three factor effect. And effectively, we've got three dominant factors that contribute to squamous gastric disease. So it's in right, inadequate roughage and the amount of exercise that the horse is doing. And it's the total amount of exercise the horse does at anything at a trot or above that matters. Um, it's not whether it has a rest day or not a rest day. It's how much they do in any given period of time, say a week. And when we add that together, we get the squamous gastric disease risk, right? So we can see here that if we have relatively high amounts of all of these risk factors, we're going to have a relatively high risk. If we take that and look at our uh, graph that we had before, what we end up with is this. We're sitting over here on the right-hand side of the spectrum because we've got a combination of multiple risk factors. What we want to do in managing these horses is push them back down this line. We want to push them back across down the line and decrease their risk of squamous gastric disease. And traditionally, the focus has been on diet. The traditionally, the focus has been particularly on grain and demonizing grain. And, but what we see here is if we just remove grain from the equation, we don't get much of an effect. We can still have a very significant risk of disease if the roughage is not appropriately addressed and the exercise is not addressed along the same, along the same, at the same time. If we can address all three of them, we can keep feeding our horses for health and feeding our horses for performance, but we can reduce the risk overall by having a multifaceted approach rather than just a singular or bifaceted approach with hay and grain being the two key factors. Exercise is really important in there. So if we think about squamous gastric disease and we think about some of those factors, probably that's not overwhelmingly sort of uh, ex uh, groundbreaking to people uh, in the terms of, you know, recognizing those three factors. But, you know, there's a couple of things here. One of, I think my favorite shows is the Mythbusters. Um, and so this is my Mythbusters edition. And the first myth that I would like to bust is, is that ad libitum hay is not protective per se. So giving horses unrestricted access to hay doesn't necessarily predict, protect them from the risk of squamous gastric disease. It's a critical factor, but there is a, a few subtleties that we've got to work in around it to actually understand it better and make sure that it works in practice. The first thing is, is the horses have to eat the hay. So providing them with unlimited hay doesn't reduce their risk if they don't eat it. It seems very intuitive and it seems very stupid when someone says that, but when was the last time that we actually measured the amount of hay that our horse eats if they've got an unlimited hay net and we actually measure it and weigh it and know exactly how much hay our horse eats? I learned this lesson down the racetrack when I was doing a study looking at omeprazole efficacy and I'd just finishing up the study and I had five more horses to do and I went down to the track, I went down to the stable and all the horses were standing there in the stable having worked that morning with this big, beautiful hay net of lush green, absolutely gorgeous looking lucerne hay. And I thought, bugger, I'm not going to be able to scope these horses. But you know what? I'll just do it anyway. Maybe I can see something. Let's see what I can see. So I went ahead and I scoped the horses and every single one of them's stomach was completely empty. And I thought, what the heck's going on here? These horses have this beautiful hay, but their stomachs are empty. They're not eating it. And so I asked the trainer, I said, you know, if the hay net's about 10 kilos, I asked the trainer, how often do you replace the hay nets? And he goes, oh, about once a week. And if we worked that out, those horses were only eating, you know, one and a half to two kilograms of hay a day. And that's simply not enough. Um, so... The other thing that's interesting is the type of hay is probably important. Historically, in equine gastric ulcers, 
we've really focused on lucerne hay. And there's some reasons for that because it has a high uh, carb um, calcium uh, component and has very good buffering capacities. But it, it's probably much more important that the horses eat an adequate quality quantity of hay rather than nutritional quality. So by quality, I don't mean, you know, moldy hay versus and dusty hay versus good quality hay. What I mean is nutritional quality. And I would rather feed my horses a large amount of medium quality uh, grass hay than small amounts of lucerne hay because that ball is central to what we do. And so if we're feeding such a small amount of lucerne hay, because if we feed them any more, they get fizzy or they get fat, then we're not necessarily achieving the protective effect that we would achieve if we fed them two or three times as much of good quality grass hay, um, let alone the expense involved in, in lucerne hay at times. So the next myth is that access to pasture is not protective either. So we've traditionally thought that if you put horses out in the paddock, they're not going to get um, gastric ulcers. And that's not true for squamous gastric disease. And I'll show you a study that says that. There's probably a role for the type of pasture, similar to the way the type of hay, it's not, not all hays are the same, not all pastures are the same. Very lush green pastures, which look great and are great for the horse nutritionally and for body condition, probably aren't ideal for the stomach in terms of preventing that acid from splashing because they lack the structural integrity to form a nice firm ball and you get a slush in the stomach rather than this nice firm ball. The same way that in ruminants we think of the, the rumen tickle factor and fibre length, I think we need to think about that in the horse and think about that our horses are eating, you know, four centimetres of fibre length in their hay rather than chaff, for example, or when we think about pasture, lush green pasture may actually not be giving us what we think it should be giving us. We know for sure that lush green pasture empties from the stomach much faster than hay empties from the stomach. And so that, that's sort of an indirect evidence that it's, it's much more liquid and they're easy to move out but if it's more liquid, it also splashes around more. So we need to think about that um, when we manage our horse for squamous gastric disease, particularly a horse that has history of disease. And we've said this, grain and processed feeds are not the devil, and we'll talk about that. So just touching on the pasture effect, this is a study from New Zealand, and basically what they showed was that there was no difference between horses that were stabled full time, horses that were kept at pasture for some of the day, or horses that were kept at pasture full time. So these were racehorses. And so if you add those other two factors in, which is the high carbohydrate diets and the exercise that these horses do, you overwhelm the protective effect of pasture. And so again, if we don't look at all three factors concurrently in terms of carbohydrate, roughage and exercise, we're not gonna get the outcome that we desire from just focusing on one of those factors. Additional roughage may be advantageous. So it seems sort of madness that we'll have our horse out on this beautiful green lush pasture. But if we have a horse that's had a history of squamous gastric disease and we want to reduce that risk further, then actually feeding that horse hay may be advantageous to reduce risk, particularly the timing of feeding that horse hay, uh, ideally before exercise to create that nice, big, firm, uh, solid ball of, in the stomach rather than a slushy grass ball in the stomach. What else we feed matters is carbohydrate. We've known that experimentally. We also know it in population studies. And this is um, one of the sort of the original cornerstone gastric ulcer papers. And basically what they said was, is that when you start to exceed a, grain, a gram per kilogram of carbohydrate, above or below that mark, there's about a two and a half fold difference in risk. So if you're above a gram per kilogram per meal, you've got a two and a half times risk than if you're below that risk. It's not a threshold effect. There's not a magic thing about the gram per kilogram, um, but it, there's a very clear cutoff there where you start to see an increased risk. Uh, for the hind gut, there is a threshold effect, and we'll talk about that um, in the next thing. But what it says is, but a gram per kilogram of starch is a lot. If you look at the, the, the non-soluble carbohydrate or the starch, uh, so the soluble carbohydrate, the starch content of, um, of most of our commercial feeds, and if you feed them, at the maximal rate that's recommended for a performance horse, for a sport horse, it's actually quite uncommon that we get above a gram per kilogram. In fact, the vast majority of them are well, well, well below that threshold. And we'll come back to that a little bit more again. But starch is important. This is an interesting study. This goes back to the idea that even hay is not necessarily productive because it's not only that they have to eat a certain amount, it's the time over which they eat it that's important. 
so if we look at this study, what this study was looking at was horses over a 24 hour period with each period starting in the morning. So uh, it's not four to 24 in terms of hours of the day, it's in terms of four hours into the experiment with the experiment starting at approximately eight o'clock in the morning. And if we look at the black line, what we see is, is that their hay intake during the day is fairly stable. And then basically between around about 10 o'clock to midnight, they stop eating and their hay intake drops quite dramatically. Um, and then what we see if we look at the pH, which is the top two lines, we see that the pH follows that trend. So it's not just important that they eat a total amount per day, it's important that they eat the hay continuously. Some of that's the buffering effect of the hay, some of that's the buffering effect of the saliva and the action of chewing. And so we have windows where the horse naturally stops eating and actually develops quite an acidic stomach. And this is really quite important when we come back to thinking about managing the horses, but also important when we think about treating horses with a meprazole. So it's this roughage ball, it's this stratification of pH, that's what matters, that's what we're aiming, and we're aiming to have that in place when we exercise our horse. So again, this shows that as we lose that roughage ball, as, we, as our hay intake goes down, our pH in our proximal stomach goes down and we start causing damage to the squamous mucosa. This is another way of looking at the same question, which says what happens if you start stretching out the meals and instead of having them continuously graze, they eat in meals. And what horses learn to do is eat meals very rapidly uh, to compensate for the fact that they're not gonna have continuous grazing. We know that ponies, particularly ponies that we're trying to restrict grass access for uh, laminitis reasons, we know that they learn to just eat faster. And so they eat more in a short period of time um, but what happens there is they then have extended periods without hay in their stomach. Not a little bit of an analogy separate from the gastric ulcers, but the same thing happens when we meal feed horses in stables is they learn to eat very fast um, and then they spend long times without. And so what we see here is if we have periods of more than six hours without feeding these horses, the risk of squamous disease goes up by about four to five times. So it's a very significant effect, meal feeding versus continuous access. Um, so how we feed matters, how we give the hay matters. So giving it in hay feeding, but also even if we're giving continuous hay, how we present the horse to the hay, that horse, hay to the horse matters. And we know that horses have evolved to be continuous grazers. And what this study basically shows us is if we look at uh, these two graphs on the left-hand side, we've got one, let's focus on that. And what we've got at the bottom are the, the dark gray and the slightly lighter gray. That's the amount of time each hour that the horse spends grazing. And then the white is resting standing and the other is resting doing other things. And so what we want to is we want the bottom of that to be as high as possible. We want these horses to be as eating continuously as possible. And when we give our horses a single hay net, what we see is, is that around about midnight, they drop down their consumption dramatically um, and they pretty much stop eating because they go to sleep. But, if we look at the graph on the right hand side, if we give the horse multiple hay nets, and this is a stable horse, but if we give the horse the option of exactly the same food, but just in two different locations, if you look at the uh, gray areas at the bottom of that graph on the right hand side, these horses spend quite a significantly greater period of their time eating. And so this hard, this behavior of grazing is so hardwired in horses that they will do it in a stable. They will take a mouthful, they will take a couple of steps, take another mouthful, go back to the original, take a mouthful. And so if we work with their evolutionary behavior, we can dramatically change the way uh, that we, we get, you know, to get more roughage into them. And this is gonna have really big implications on uh, the gastric pH based on that first graph that we saw, that as that hay intake drops down, the gastric pH becomes very acidic uh, up on the squamous mucosa. So multiple hay nets makes a big difference to the amount of roughage a horse will consume in a day. How you exercise matters, sort of. How you exercise doesn't matter in the sense that when we look at this graph that we talked about before, everything at or above a trot is the same. So if we go out and warm, out our, warm up our horse and we spend a lot of time trotting and thinking that that's better for the horse's stomach than you know, doing the high performance stuff, that's simply not true. What we want to do is try and limit the amount of time that our horse is spending from a stomach point of view, from a squamous mucosa point of view, limit the amount of time that the horse is spending at anything trot or above. And so 
we go out, we warm up our horse, we exercise our horse, and then when we're cooling down our horse, which is probably the better opportunity we have to change the behavioural aspects or our riding aspects, instead of cooling the horse down through a trot and going back through that stage, just simply come back to a walk and let our horse cool down with a long extended walk rather than a short trot period. And from a stomach point of view, that's going to reduce the risk of squamous disease because it's going to reduce the amount of time that acid is spent splashing up onto that squamous mucosa. How long we exercise does matter. So that's what we just touched on. How long we exercise over the course of a week matters because it's a little bit like having a uh, cigarette lighter and how long you hold it to your skin is going to determine how deep it burns. And that's all that the hydrochloric acid is doing is a physical burn. The longer you hold it there, the deeper it'll burn. So what we want to do is try and limit that period of exposure as much as time, as much as possible, and think about how we ride our horse, particularly if we've got a horse that has a history of disease um, and a history of recurrent disease that is sometimes refractory to our standard, you know, initial approaches at management. So if we look at this three factor effect, we talked about these three and we said when they're all present, we can get quite a high risk of squamous gastric disease. If we're able to get into these, this framework where we're starting to get less than a gram per kilogram of carbohydrate, we get over a percent per uh, body weight per day of roughage, and we focus on how we exercise the horse and reduce the intensity of the exercise and just focus, sorry, reduce the duration of exercise and focus on high intensity sort of interval training or high intensity short duration exercise, then the combination of that is that we dramatically reduce our squamous gastric disease risk. So it comes together quite nicely much more so than if we just focused on one aspect or another. So we move from here back down to here, which is the goal of what we're trying to achieve. The final thing that matters is when you exercise relative to feeding, which is an important factor. And so this was a study that I did looking at racehorses and what, uh, sorry, this was one of my PhD studies. And what we did was we had these gastric cannulas in the horse, which is on the bottom right there. And we were able to measure the pH in the bottom half of the stomach over a 24 hour period, which is that trace across the bottom. And so you see at baseline, it sits around two and then pops up to sort of five to seven um, in the morning and afternoon. And that pop-up was actually associated with feeding. There was no drugs given to these horses. And these were the control horses. And so what we saw was when we fed these horses a significant bolus of food, we were able to basically remove all of the acid in the stomach for a couple of hours. Now, for these horses, it was a significant bolus. They were eating a half their body weight in grain and hay at each meal. So they were eating um, about two and a half kilos of hay and two and a half kilos of grain. But what it meant was when we gave these horses this very significant meal, there was a window of opportunity that if we were to exercise the horse in there, we would dramatically reduce the risk of squamous disease because simply there was no acid to splash around these horses' stomachs. It had been soaked up by the food and it had been neutralized by the bicarbonate that comes down the saliva. And that's before the volatile fatty acid production really gets started and starts causing the issues, even with these horses eating very high grain meals. So that's led to a recommendation that we should feed racehorses a handful of chaff before exercise. And I simply just don't think that's enough. I think if we really want to impact on disease, this is probably where we want to feed them a reasonable amount of, you know, something like lucerne hay, a highly palatable hay that they're going to eat rapidly, but they're going to chew a lot. Um, the chewing is really important because the more they chew, the more bicarbonate they make, the more bicarbonate they make, the more buffering you get out of the stomach. So you want them to chew. We know they chew a lot less when you feed them grain or when you feed them chaff than if you actually feed them hay. So if we can get these horses eating, even a biscuit of hay before they exercise, we'll have a dramatic reduction in their risk of squamous gastric disease. For sports horses, we feed them very differently, so the risk is actually a different thing. When we look at this graph again, what we recognised was if we looked between sort of 10 o'clock at night and 6 o'clock in the morning, these horses spend very little time eating. And that's what we see on the right graph there is that as we approach each 24-hour period of the study, the amount of hay that they're intaking drops down quite dramatically and the pH drops down quite dramatically as well. So what that means is if we're to exercise these horses in the morning before they had a chance to sort of wake up and have their breakfast, if we exercise these horses in the morning, we greatly increase their risk of squamous gastric disease. And if we look at the graph on the right and we sort of look at the middle and the one across on the, the right hand side of the three lots, what we see is around eight to 12 hours um, after the study started, which is about sort of in the afternoon, four to eight o'clock in the afternoon, is when we have 
A, the highest hay consumption, but B, the highest pH in the horse's stomach, so in the proximal stomach. So that's the ideal time to exercise a sport horse um, because that's the time when it's spent most of the day eating its hay. It's got a really good buffering capacity in its stomach and it's going to have much less effect in terms of being able to splash acid up because both there's a physical bolus there and also there's just less acid in the horse's stomach because we've had saliva coming in all day to neutralize and buffer that horse's stomach. So when we exercise the horse really matters, um, particularly again, if we've got an at-risk horse. So the summary for squamous gastric disease is the three-factor approach. We want to get less than a gram per kilogram per meal. The vast majority of our the vast majority of our sport horses never eat anywhere near a gram per kilogram in a meal. The, we want to optimize the roughage intake. If in doubt, we should measure the roughage intake. We want them to eat at least 1% body weight per day. And if in an ideal world, we want them to eat as much hay as they possibly can. Obviously, if we've got obesity issues, that's a different thing. But if it's a horse in hard work, we want them to spend as much time eating hay as possible. So giving them multiple hay bed in the multiple locations to eat, particularly when they're stable. And we want to reduce the quantity of exercise, the total amount of exercise that they perform. The timing of exercise is important for our sport horses. We prefer to exercise them in the afternoon and I, or after the intake of a significant hay meal or both. You know, if we've got a horse that's got a long history of squamous gastric disease, then while we, we, when we get to the stables, throw that horse its, its lucerne hay nice palatable something that it's going to eat in a short period of time while you get your tack together while you get your boots on while you exchange socially important information with your friends and about your other friends and you know use that sort of 10 or 15 minutes to protect the horse's stomach and then go out and ride and you'll dramatically reduce the risk of disease in total or for squamous disease so do we need drugs? Uh, my experience is actually when you put all of these together and you manage these horses really well, that it's actually quite rare to see squamous disease because the timing and the way we feed them can mitigate the risk of the exercise in the vast majority of them. Uh, but it's very common in racehorses regardless of the management. And that's because they A, have poor roughage intake, but they also have these fairly high exercise loads and they have a very high carbohydrate intake. It's much, much more than we would ever feed a sport horse. And somewhere in the middle fits endurance horses and managing endurance horses is a real challenge to get those three, those three factors done because the exercise ones are a real challenge to keep the horses fit. Much easier to do it in a dressage horse or a show jumper or even a three-day eventer or even a polo cross horse than it is to do it obviously in an endurance horse. So in those horses, because the combination of the three factors gets higher, we very often need to think about treating those horses pharmacologically. So when we treat these horses, you know, omeprazole is the cornerstone drug, and we'll talk very briefly about that in a second. Uh, we also have ranitidine, which is uh, used, but really has gone out of favor because we recognize that omeprazole is superior. And then we have mesoprostol, which is another drug that we sometimes use, which actually is both um, a, sort of stimulates healing as well as having acid suppression effects. But we're not, we're not going to go into detail on that. But what we will do is talk briefly about um, what happens when we give a meprazole horse and how we can maximize the outcome of that. So this is a study, uh, one of my PhD studies. And again, these horses had these gastric cannulas in. And what we did in this study was we looked at um, a, a meprazole formulation. It was the international global standard formulation. We looked at the treatment and prevention dose. And we gave these horses either unrestricted hay, which was a combination predominantly of oaten and ryegrass with a little bit of lucerne mixed in. And or we fed them this racehorse diet, which was 1% uh, of their body weight split into two meals morning and night. And these horses were stable the entire time. And we followed them over a six day period with a baseline day and five days of monitoring. And what we saw here was we saw a very significant impact of diet and that feeding impairs both drug absorption when we measured drug concentrations and drug efficacy. So if you look across on the right there, we've got the results. Basically the top is horses that fasted overnight the bottom is horses that had unrestricted access to hay. The red line is the high dose, the four mg per kg. The blue line is the low dose, one mg per kg. And on the left of the graph, what we see is the percentage of time that we spent above a pH of four. And what we want to be is above a pH of four for healing about 16 hours a day. And that's that green line. So where we want to be is we want to be above that green line. And what we see here is that when we're looking particularly at the glandular mucosa, because this probe was very much 
where the glandular mucosa is, what we see is, is a couple of really significant things. If we look at the overnight fast is we do see a difference between dose. We see that the higher dose had more effect when we fast these horses overnight. But we see a lot of individual variability as well. We see that um, there are some horses which are those individual circles that even at the low dose did very well. And there's other horses that at the high dose struggled to get above that threshold. We can't change individual variability, but we do need to recognize that when we treat these horses, some are going to respond really well and some just don't respond to the medication, even though it's designed to do what it's designed to do. It just simply doesn't work that well in, in some horses because they don't absorb the drug effectively. But the really critical thing when we think about feeding is that if we look at the bottom where these horses had unrestricted access to hay, what we see is the ability to induce acid suppression dramatically drops off. And the time that these horses spend with a therapeutic uh, a level of acid suppression is very, very low. And in fact, on average, neither of the doses, even at the high dose, even at the treatment dose, we weren't getting uh, acid suppression compatible with healing glandular mucosa um, when these horses were eating ad libitum hay. So when we treat horses with omeprazole, we need to fiddle with their diet to ensure that they absorb the drug effectively. And to do that, we need these horses to have an overnight fast. We do still see some individuals do very well, but what we see is the average effect drop off. And we see some individuals, even at the four mg per kg, do very, very poorly, which is those triangles down the bottom of that bottom graph. So quite important because we're gonna spend a lot of money on omeprazole, we wanna make sure that we get an optimal outcome. When we feed matters as well, omeprazole actually needs, once we've given the drug and the drug gets absorbed, we actually need the horse to, and this would be the drug concentrations going up over time, we actually need the horse to eat to stimulate, to activate the drug and make the drug work. And so what we see here is that when we feed these, when these horses are um, basically fasting overnight, we give the drug, they absorb the drug, but it's only when we feed them and activate the drug that we actually start to see acid suppression, which sits up above here. And then we see very commonly it drops off back down by around about, you know, early next morning, four to six o'clock the next morning. So, Fasting them overnight is important, timing feeding is important. And so ad libitum hay is actually the worst thing to do when we're trying to treat horses gastric ulcers or at least some horses for gastric ulcers. Um, we know it's important for prevention, but when we're going through that therapeutic phase, particularly when we're treating glandular disease, we actually need to enforce an overnight fast to ensure the drug gets absorbed. And that's counterintuitive, but the additional benefit we get from the drug and the additional um, uh, acid suppression we get from the drug overrides the, the downside of having the horse starve overnight. It's relatively easy to do that in most sport horse stables because horses stop eating about 10 o'clock at night. Um, I've shown you some data on that and I'll show you some more in a second that basically shows that if you feed horses hay in a stable, they stop, they go to sleep about 10 o'clock at night and stop eating. They finish their meal and that's it. So what we're really trying to do for these horses is make sure they don't have breakfast before we give them their drug, right? We're not trying to starve them for an extended period of time. We're just trying to get in and give them the drug before they have breakfast so they can absorb the drug and then give them breakfast later. Time is important. So we aim to feed them around about 60 minutes after we've given the omeprazole, but even 30 minutes makes a big difference to the amount of drug the horse is going to absorb. So even if you're busy, if you can just give the drug, do a few other things like make up the feeds, take the rugs off, that sort of thing, and then come back and feed the horse, you're gonna get a lot more bang for your buck um, with a omeprazole than if you just give it all at the same time and don't pay attention to these factors. And, and hay seems to have the best effect. If we give hay, we get these horses to have a, big, a bigger stimulus of gastric acid production with gastrin, and they're gonna turn on more pumps and deactivate more pumps at the same time. So in an ideal world, what we actually want to do is get these horses, fast them overnight, give them the drug, wait 60 minutes, feed them one or two biscuits of hay. And this is where I would use something like lucerne hay because it's highly palatable. Then give them their grain. Now they've got a nice big ball of hay in their stomach. It's stratified to protect the squamous mucosa. There's lots of bicarbonate in there because the horse has been chewing a lot. Give them their grain into that environment and then tip them out in the paddock or leave them in the paddock and let them go for the day, repeat the cycle in the afternoon. And if we want them to eat more hay, that's when we can give them a larger quantity of grass hay or something like that. So we can really play around with these things to optimize outcome. So what this means in practice terms is the horse has had a fast overnight. We're going to uh, give it some omeprazole in the morning, feed it, 
let it have hay. We know they eat about 70 to 80% of the amount of roughage during the day anyway. Finish their evening feed and aim to have them finish their meal by about 10 o'clock at night. And then just repeat the cycle as we're doing treatment. When we come out of treatment and we stop using the drug, we go back to the idea of multiple hay nets to, to improve at nighttime eating and to increase the amount of time they spend eating at night. This is solely when we're giving them Eprazole to optimize efficacy. Okay, we move briefly on to glandular prevention, which is much quicker. Uh, what doesn't matter is what you feed, how you, or when you exercise. It makes no difference because the glandular mucosa is used to being bathed in acid. And so all of these factors that shift acid around the horse's stomach in the squamous mucosa have absolutely nothing to do with glandular. And changing them is not going to reduce your risk of glandular disease. It's not a disease of diet. It's got nothing to do with any of these factors that we've just spent a long time talking about. But we can address risk factors. And what that means is we can build in rest days for these horses. We can schedule them two to three absolute rest days per week. And we can have them work harder on the exercise days, but then make sure they have these rest days in between. So it goes back to this idea of intent, short, focused, intense training rather than long, drawn out, extended training anything a trot or above. And environmental enrichment, I think, is critical for these horses. Letting them express their natural behaviour by cohabitation, letting them express natural grooming behaviour by making sure they don't have too many rugs on or any rugs on so they can groom and do all these things that horses normally do to optimise their welfare. We all love our horses, but sometimes we inadvertently compromise their welfare by trying to take care of them too much. And rugging's a, a really hot topic for that. What about if we want to put these horses on drugs? Well, this is much harder because these horses, are, these sport horses are horses that tend to live on pasture. They're horses that we want to have on unrestricted hay or unrestricted roughage to reduce their risk of squamous disease. And what we just saw was when we try and put these horses on omeprazole, omeprazole is not very effective under those conditions at increasing the pH of the bottom half of the stomach. So Prevention though, omeprazole really are very inconsistent. It's not, it's hard, you can't say they don't work, but they don't consistently work. And it's hit and miss whether it will work in an individual horse um, at prevention when we have horses under these conditions because the dose um, is, is potentially too low, the diet impairs drug absorption, and, um, and we have this ventral part of the stomach where the acid tends to accumulate. So a number of things. What I will do for these horses is I will put them on pulse therapy around high risk periods, i.e. competition periods. So if I have a horse that has a history of glandular disease and these horses very commonly show most of their clinical signs at shows, I will go ahead and I will put them on a omeprazole during those periods, but in between I really focus on other factors for reducing their risk. So can we feed my performance horse safely? And the answer is yes. The answer is that if we, if we look at a multifactorial approach, and we reduce the carbohydrate intake, we make sure they're eating enough roughage, and we focus on the quantity of exercise um, and reduce the overall quantity, and we focus on the timing of exercise, we can have a really big impact on squamous gastric disease. On glandular gastric disease, the feeding doesn't matter. It's not a disease of diet, but there are other things that are important, and we may have an indirect effect of improving their diet and improving their behavioral aspects of diet may reduce their stress, and so there may be an indirect effect but you know, it's, it's a little bit more of a, a long string to draw on your bow than the direct effect for squamous gastric disease. So what else can I do? You know, I'm doing all of these things and I'm still concerned my horse has risk or I'm doing these things and I know my horse still gets disease. Um, hopefully I've, there's been some additional tools in the talk that beyond just the very sort of simple approach that there's some nuances that we can work around that can, you can adapt, but there's other things that we can do as well. So this was a study I did um, about, this one was published, I can't remember, about uh, 2014 or something like that. Um, it was a study I did for uh, another company, and this is how I actually ended up with Colato because um, Colato were not involved in this research. It was done independently of them, but uh, Colato have picked this up, and it's one of their cornerstone products that they're going to talk to you about in a second. And so what we did in this study was we looked at a combination of apolectol, which is pectin and lecithin, uh, brewer's yeast, saccharomyces, and magnesium oxide um, in these horses. And what we saw was when we looked at the squamous disease risk, uh, we had these horses, these are horses that had been treated with omeprazole, and these were race horses under extreme sort of risks uh, because of their sort of natural environment that we've talked about, or unnatural environment that we've talked about. 
And what we saw was um, that we were able, with the, with the treatment group on the left-hand side, when we took them off omeprazole, which they had to be two or less to take them off, we took them off omeprazole, and when we treated them, their risk didn't change over the next 28 days. Whereas if we put them on a placebo, they, their risk of disease increased. And we saw a large number of those horses develop ulcers, and we saw a lot of those horses develop very severe ulcers. So, um, so we saw a, a clear benefit of treatment here, which is good, but we also know that if we do a lot of diet things, we can reduce the risk of squamous disease. Where I personally got really excited about this research and where I think it has a really uh, big utility is in glandular disease where we have such a limited ability to act risk factors, um, we need another tool. And I think that this comes in, you know, as another tool that we can use to manage those at-risk horses or horses with a history of disease. So again, we see the glandular grade, we see no difference with treatment, and we see that they worsen, not just in terms of the number that worsen, um, but also we saw some very, very severe lesions in the horses that were on the placebo group, whereas the vast majority of horses in the treatment group didn't change, or if anything, actually went down slightly um, with, with treatment. So, um, you know, that's a really positive outcome. And, and at the time, we were really struggling for tools for gastric ulcer syndrome, and we had for a long time, and, and I actually came across the GastroAid uh, in Horseland one day and, you know, was really excited to see it as a commercial product because I think it's something that can really make a difference to the management of our horses. And um, as a result of that, I ended up chatting with Colato and here we are talking about gastric ulcers. So um, significant effect of treatment there, something that I think is really valuable in our toolbox and something that I have my own horses on. Um, I have horses that have had a history of disease and also horses at risk of disease, um, as well as having horses that, you know, my clients that have a history of particularly glandular disease. Um, you know, this is a product that I actually use quite, quite a lot. So with that, I'll finish up um, and hand over to Nat. And then um, I think we're gonna have a short break and be happy to come back and answer some questions. Thank you for your uh, attention. Everyone can see it. So I might leave my video off because I've been having some connection problems this evening and that might help. Um, but I'll just talk a little bit about our digestive health products. We have two in our range, Gastroid Recovery, as Ben mentioned, and Gastroid Every Day. Now, Gastroid Recovery is our premium product targeting both foregut and hindgut health and aids horses recovering from gastric ulcers and other common digestive conditions. We recommend supplementing horses with gastroid recovery during high risk periods for EGIS. And as Ben discussed, while omeprazole remains the treatment of choice for a squamous gastric disease, the efficacy of omeprazole alone for glandular gastric disease is questionable. So as he mentioned, some of his research has focused on finding effective adjunctive therapies for EGIS, which is what led him to gastroid recovery. Now, how does it work? While gastroid recovery targets total digestive tract health, I'll just discuss the ingredients that benefit stomach health for this part of the webinar series as we are going to cover the hindgut in webinar three. So gastroid recovery contains the antacids sodium bicarbonate, calcium carbonate, and magnesium oxide, which act as a buffer to neutralize the pH of stomach acid. And since horses produce large volumes of stomach acid on a continuous basis, the antacids won't be able to buffer all of the acid, but it's their action with the coating agents, pectin and lecithin, that's key. And gastroid recovery is unique because it contains the combination of antacids and therapeutic levels of the coating agents, pectin and lecithin, which help to promote a healthy stomach lining. So pectin is a water-soluble fiber found in the cell walls of fruits, tubers, and the stems of plant cell membranes. And in the presence of a low pH, such as what's found in the horse's stomach, pectin forms a gel-like solution. To put it in perspective, we use pectins to make jam and give them that jelly-like consistency. The pectin will then bind to bile acids in the stomach, this increases the buffering capacity of the stomach acid and helps to stabilize the protective mucus in the glandular region of the stomach. And lecithin is an abundant naturally occurring phospholipid. 
It and phospholipids are made up of two fatty acid tails that are attached to a glycerol head. The glycerol head region of the molecule is hydrophilic, which means it attracts water. Whereas on the other end, the fatty acid tail is hydrophobic, which means it repels water. So lecithin helps to stabilize the natural phospholipid layer of the horse's stomach. In acidic conditions, lecithin will immediately break down into a mix of reactive phospholipids and the hydrophilic water-loving head will attach to the stomach lining, leaving the hydrophobic water-repelling tail exposed to the stomach contents. This arrangement helps to repel gastric acid away from the stomach wall And uh, so with this combination of antacids and coating agents, they provide an enhanced barrier for the squamous mucosa and supplement the natural defense mechanisms of the glandular mucosa in the horse's stomach, which would be that mucobicarbonate layer. And in terms of benefits, gastroid recovery targets total digestive tract health. It supports horses recovering from or those that are at risk of EGIS. It promotes an optimal stomach environment. And you'll start to see improvements in your horse in areas such as behavior, appetite, body condition, and performance. You can choose to use gastroid recovery strategically during high risk periods, or it's also safe to use long-term. Now, the other product that we have is Gastroid Every Day, which is an economical supplement formulated to maintain the health and function of the total digestive tract. So its daily use acknowledges the importance of optimal digestive function for a healthier, happier horse. Now, Gastroid Every Day buff also buffers stomach acid, but we've used a different buffer. We've used a calcified red algae that provides a rich source of calcium, which is what buffers stomach acid. And the red algae has a superior buffering capacity due to its unique honeycomb structure, which gives it a large surface area. And because it has this porous material, it breaks down slowly, which gives it a longer buffering effect. So again, these buffers are gonna to help to reduce the negative effects of repeated acid exposure on the sensitive stomach lining. And with Gastrate Every Day, we've also included coating agents, but it contains significantly less coating agents compared to Gastrate Recovery, which is why it's designed more as a maintenance product. So we have some psyllium husk in there, which is high in fiber and mucilage and mucilage will also form that gelatinous material. And then we've also used some lecithin, which you now know is a phospholipid and will help to repel acid away from the stomach lining. So again, contains quite a bit less than gastroid recovery, um, which is why we recommend the other product for horses at risk of ulcers. And gastroid every day is also particularly beneficial for hindgut health. But again, that's something that I will discuss next webinar. In terms of benefits, Gastroid Every Day uh, has been pelleted and this, it's a really palatable pellet, so it makes it really easy to feed and it's particularly beneficial for horses that might not be receiving much of a hard feed. You can basically hand feed it to them. It's also value for money, so it's more economical over a long-term period. It maintains total gut function, enhances total gut health, and it's also safe for long-term use. Now, one of the most common questions we get is, which product should I use with my horse? So we've created a handy decision tree to help horse owners select the right product. Again, gastroid recovery is for horses recovering from or at risk of gastric ulcers, and gastroid every day is more of a maintenance supplement. So the first question we would ask when talking to the horse owner is, are the, is the horse showing signs of gastric ulcers? If the horse isn't showing any signs, then they can technically go straight onto gastroid every day. But if they are showing signs, we then ask, has the horse been scoped? And if the horse owner doesn't want to go down the scoping path, as, as you know, it's the only way to definitively diagnose gastric ulcers, their location and their severity. So if the horse hasn't been scoped, we would then assess the risk factors 
Is it squamous disease? Is the horse on a high carbohydrate diet? Are they in intense work? Are they intensively managed? Or is it glandular gastric disease? Uh, is the horse a warm bladder? Is there breed disposition? Uh, is the horse exposed to behavioral stressors such as uh, five to seven days in work each week? Or do, do they have multiple handlers or riders? So following an assessment of risk factors, we would always recommend that you consult with your veterinarian and treat according to their recommendations. The other important thing that Ben mentioned is obviously we need to also address those risk factors and implement management practices to help promote a healthy stomach lining and reduce the risk of reoccurrence. So have these risk factors been addressed? If yes, then you can consider going on to gastrate every day as a maintenance supplement. But if you can't address those risk factors, then we recommend going on to gastroid recovery. And the good thing is you can change between the products as the risk, factor cha risk factors change. We just recommend allowing at least three weeks between those changes. And then coming all the way back um, to has the horse been gastroscope? And it, yes, if they have, and again, if gastric ulcers aren't present, then the owner can consider gastroid every day as a maintenance supplement. So um, got some questions here and we'll go ahead and um, answer those. And so I'll just start from the top. Um, so the first question is, with the prevalence of glandular disease in sport horses, would you consider that practices such as roll cure and aggressive riding practices to put dressage and show jumpers at higher risk? Uh, I'm studying Dr. Andrew McLean's equitation science program and I've noticed that stressy horses seem to be those ridden with strong hands and nagging legs. So one of the, uh, one of the risk factors that we didn't touch on today but we uh, talked about last time is that in a study looking at uh, sport horses in Finland, so predominantly a warm blood population but also um, different sort of strains of warm bloods and then also some cold horse, cold blood breeds, the fin horse predominantly, they saw that the risk factors associated with glandular disease were primarily being a warm blood was the single biggest risk factor. But then the other two factors that came up were an increasing number of riders or an increasing number of handlers in general. And I think we have to be a little bit careful of, you know, anthropomorphizing too much, but I think it's relatively easy to make a story that um, having multiple riders would be quite a stressful event for you know a sensitive dressage horse. Obviously, if you've got a big buff head that doesn't really care, it's not gonna make too much difference. But you know, a horse that's you know a naturally sensitive horse, um, you know, potentially has a thing. And and the whole way that we ride horses is a lot about pressure and about release of pressure. And so if we're if we're doing these techniques that require us uh, to put pressure on horses and it requires them to understand what we're asking of them to release the pressure, if we make that hard for them by either making the pressure too intense or by making it hard for them to understand what needs to be done to get away from the pressure, then yeah, I think we do increase their behavioral stress and that have an effective increase in their risk of glandular gastric disease. So, um, so it would be, you know, sometimes it would be specific practices. Sometimes it would be specific riders, but it's going to be really important, the horse rider interaction, because if the horse is a big buff head and doesn't care, then it's probably not going to make a difference. But if you have a horse that's very sensitive and let's say a very busy rider, um, then, you know, we're creating a situation there that the horse would potentially have an increased um, stress response associated with that. And they're the horses that we probably should avoid um, a, as riders, we should focus on how we ride those horses individually, but B, they're also horses that we should be really conscious of, um, you know, not having multiple riders ride them, those sorts of things. They don't make good schoolmasters. We know that because they're hard to ride, but also from their own point of view, they don't make good schoolmasters. So, so I think there's definitely factors in there that are important. The next question we had was regarding the risk of exercise for squamous gastric disease and endurance horses. It makes sense to train them smart to minimize splashing, but what can you do in competition? And then it probably relates to the next therapy, uh, sorry, the next question, which is to clarify what I mean by pulse therapy and, and how does this assist? 
So what I mean by pulse therapy is, is putting these horses that we've identified to either be at high risk of disease or horses that we, um, we see very commonly, we see these horses, they're quite, they're quite normal at home. They've got good appetites at home and um, they eat well, they drink well and everything's fine at home. And then they go away to competition and they stop eating. And gastric ulcers or particularly squamous disease is not the only reason why they do that. Um, but I think it's a major reason why they do that. And it's a, if they've got an underlying disease process like glandular disease ticking along in the background, we add those additional factors on top and then we reach a threshold where these horses go ahead and express clinical disease. And their most common expression of clinical disease is either going to be inappetence, which I think is very common for squamous disease. I think it's the horse version of heartburn. Um, or that um, these horses are going to maybe have mild bouts of colic or they're going to have behavioural issues with, with rideability and stuff like that. So it might be a horse that's a complete angel to ride at home and then for no apparent reason it goes to competition and behaves like a complete idiot and is very frustrating to ride. And I think we've all had those experiences. If you haven't, you've been very lucky um, to own a horse that doesn't do that. Um, so those horses are horses that I will... Um, look to manage their environment at home, look to manage their diet at home to reduce their glandular and squamous risk respectively. But there are also horses that, you know, I think the, the gastro aid products are very well suited to, to try and provide a baseline level of stability to those horses, um, to their gastrointestinal stability, and also to provide some symptomatic control to those horses. And if I've got a horse that's still breaking through that, then they're the horses that are on a meprazole when they travel. And so, what I'll do is let's say I'm going away for the weekend and I've got one horse that does exactly this. He's perfectly fine at home. He's great, but he goes away and he just will not eat. I don't get overly fussed that he doesn't eat. I don't think that overly impacts on his performance. But what really worries me is if he doesn't eat, he doesn't drink. And if he doesn't drink, then I'm worried he's going to get sick. And, you know, we cart horses regularly four to eight hours every weekend or every second weekend. And the last thing I want to do is have, my, my good horse who I've got a lot of time for um, and really have, you know, really like, uh, or any horse in my care, you know, you know, get sick because it's not drinking water. And so I really want to make sure they stay eating because if they keep eating, they keep drinking. It's quite uncommon to have a horse that will eat and not drink unless it's particularly sensitized to town water. So what I do with those horses is if, they, if that background care of, of dietary management, of uh, nutraceutical management with something like the gastro aid, um, and risk factor management's good at home, but not working when they go away to competitions or to training, then I'll add a meprazole in there. And what I'll do is when those horses are traveling, they're usually staying in stables and it's relatively easy to tweak the feeding to ensure that we get that good absorption of a meprazole. It used to be thought that to get a meprazole to work, we had to give it three to five days, sort of wind up and get maximal effect. But what we know now is if you look at those graphs that I showed you is that if we optimize the feeding conditions, i.e. give it on an empty stomach and then feed them 30 minutes to an hour later, uh, we get a very, very good effect even out of the first dose. So I'll use a, me a meprazole very strategically around those travel periods to do that. Nat, do you want to see if you want to come back on and answer the next question? Can you hear me? No? I'm not talking to my sound. Oh, Nat's still having tech issues there. That's okay. Uh, it, it, you know, it's Murphy's Law. It all works until you really need it to work. Um, so the next question is, when do you move from gastroid recovery to gastroid every day? I, for me, it's a matter of whether you feel like you can address the risk factors. So I like, if I, if I start them on something, I like to keep them on for a minimum of three weeks and ideally six weeks because I think stability is really important, particularly for the hindgut we'll talk about um, next time. So I don't want to change back and forward between them, but there is clearly, you know, there's, there's a clear price difference if nothing else between the two formulations. So I'll use recovery during that initial stage and then I'll really work hard to address those risk factors. I feel like I've been able to address those risk factors satisfactorily and I feel like I'm moving down that scale of risk, then I'll transition across to, uh, to the everyday as well. And the everyday, um, it's not that the everyday doesn't do the stomach, it just doesn't have the pectin in it, which is the do, you know, one of the very dominant things in the recovery. So um, you're still going to get a stomach benefit out of it. Um, and again, it goes, if you think about that idea of the three-factor effect, 
um, as, as things that add up, something like the gas raid recovery or every day is going to be a negative on top of that. So it just helps push you down further down that, um, that risk uh, because of the, you know, it takes away from the cumulative effect of those other three factors. So as I said, I like to have them on it for three, ideally six weeks. Um, but then if I'm happy that I've changed the risk factors, I've got their management sorted out, then I'll go ahead and back off. Uh, there was a question in the chat whether we would use the gas raid recovery from a vet. Um, shout out there to Paula, um, gas raid recovery at the same time that I would treat a horse with a meprazole for pyloric um, disease. And the, and the answer is yes, I would. One of the things that we've learnt um, in, terms of, um, in terms of research over the last 10 years is that those glandular lesions respond very poorly to just a meprazole. Um, if, we, if all we do is put them on a meprazole, the treatment response we get is in around about the 25% range for them. It's, you know, compared to sort of 70 to 90% for squamous disc for a meprazole, it, the glandular just simply doesn't respond as well. So when we're treating those lesions for glandulars, and this is one of the really important things why we need to differentiate squamous from glandular, uh, because it does change our treatment. When we're treating those, um, when we're treating those uh, glandular lesions, the, um, I will add something else in. And traditionally it's been a meprazole and sacrolfate. There's some other medications we consider, uh, but I will add the gastro in at, aid at the, in at the same time. If the owner's willing to do all three, I'll do a meprazole, sacrolfate, and gastro aid. And then ideally, as the glandular lesions improve, I'm going to drop off on the uh, meprazole and sacrolfate and try and stay on the gastro aid as a recovery, the gastro aid recovery as a long term maintenance. And then they ideally drop down to the everyday if finances are a concern. If finances aren't a concern, the horse is still got significant risk factors, then I'll just stay on the recovery indefinitely. If the owners, you know, if finances are limited or sacrolfate can be very hard to get sometimes, then I will substitute the gastroid recovery for the sulfate um, and just go with the meprazole and the gastroid recovery. And I haven't done that enough to have, you know, data on it yet, um, but it's something I think that is intuitively very, very logical, very, very logically, uh, very logical, sorry, to, to, to put in. So. Um, maybe in you know another year or two, I'll be able to come here and say, look, we did some studies and this is what we showed. But at the moment, I think it certainly makes sense based on what we know. What I think we get out of this, which then leads to the, the next question from, from uh, someone else, which is if the gastroid forms a lining of the gut wall, how does the acid get through and um, to the contents of the gut? The acid is actually really cool. Um, it, 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 normally in the horse's stomach, the mucosa, the mucobicarbonate layer is very, very thin. It's a couple of millimetres, very, very thin and lines and protects the stomach. But the acid actually goes through like little volcanoes. It goes, or it looks like an ant farm if you actually look at it. And these little structures, and the acid doesn't just randomly diffuse through. It's actually transported through um, these little uh, channels the same way if you looked at it, it would look like you're looking at an ant farm or a volcano. So you get these little bursts of acid um, and what that does is it means that the, the mucosa here um, and the acids and the, the mucobicarbonate like here, and you've got the acid coming out here, you're not getting the acid actually touching the mucosa. So we say that the mucosa is used to being in a pH of one to two, but it's not the mucosa itself that's used to being in that because it's protected by this very thin mucobicarbonate layer. Um, the, what I, my, my personal feeling is what we get with products, particularly like the recovery, but also to some degree the everyday with the marine algae, uh, uh, calcium derived marine um, stuff, sorry. Uh, but with the pectin less than what I think we effectively get is an alkaline slime. Um, and the slime simply sort into that mucobicarbonate layer and reinforces the mucobicarbonate layer and behaves in a very similar manner. So the acid can still get to where it needs to go. We know those horses, if we look at the gastric acidity of those horses, we know that, that these sorts of buffers make very little difference to the actual pH of the horse's stomach. But what we see is that they start to get, um, but what I think is happening at a mucosal level is we're getting enhancement of that mucobicarbonate layer an enhancement of that normal defense mechanism. And I think that's why we see clinical improvement associated with them. And I think it's why we see gastroscopic and um, benefits, particularly for prevention, particularly as we come out of that therapeutic stage, we start to see, uh, you know, it's reinforcing that mucobicarbonate layer is the critical aspect for prevention. Um, 
So we have a special guest from Finland who's jumped in asking if the Collado products are available in Europe. Um, and we, we can contact you directly about that. Uh, followed on with a, is the beard a permanent thing now? And yes, can we call you Gander off the grey? So uh, this is my sister-in-law, fresh from Finland. And uh, no, Sonia, the beard's not permanent. It's my isolation beard. I'm going to shave it off when normality resumes. Um, and it's simply what Wolverine would look like if you gave him a few extra years um, as you fluff it up and that sort of thing. Uh, the last question that we had come in, or second last question we had to come in, um, was about the omeprazole. And really what we've been talking about here is the oral omeprazole. There's also an injectable formulation, and that's something that, you know, that can be used in specific cases and something that, you know, is a conversation to definitely have with your veterinarian. It is a drug I was involved in the development of um, and, you know, has a lot of promise, uh, but it's probably inappropriate for me to talk about it in, in great detail here. And then the last question, just to finish up, uh, came in by email. Um, there was one question very specifically about a case, and I'm sorry, I, I, I don't think it's probably the best position here to answer that. Um, but there was, um, there was another case asking about the link between ulcers and colic and do we need to treat for ulcers in, you know, in all horses that have colic? Um, and the answer is, is no, we don't need to treat for every horse. But I think what we need to do when a horse has an episode of colic, we need to ask ourselves rather than just treat the colic and make the clinical signs go away and, and you know, feel that, that we're happy that everything's better. I think when we see colic and we treat colic, what we really want to do is, is make the clinical signs go away in the immediate period, but then really ask ourselves, why did the horse get colic in the first place? And so for some of our competition horses, it's going to be glandular, it's going to be gastric ulcers, particularly I think in the warm blood population, glandular disease, and our sensitive thoroughbred population. And if we see multiple episodes of colic, then one of the first things I will do personally is go ahead and gastroscope those horses and make sure they don't have lesions because it's something we can change and it's something we can change in the short term with treatment and the long term with strategies and management and important to do. Um, the other thing I think that's really important when we think about colic flows into our next talk, which will come up, um, you know, in another weeks, which is the hindgut and uh, a lot of talk about hindgut ulcers and we'll, we'll you know, we'll definitely uh, deal with that head on. But also, I think just changes in fecal microbiota and dysbiosis, I think, are really important, significant contributors to, to colic in the horse. And we're starting to build a body of evidence that, um, that, that, those, that, that dysbiosis is actually precedes the episode of colic. So instead of thinking as colic as a disease, we need to think of colic as a symptom of an underlying process that's going on. And if we want to stop the the process, we can't just treat the symptom, we need to actually deal with the underlying process, which is, which is you know, going to be some form of gastric dysbiosis um, in, a, in many of those horses, the horses that have a non-specific uh, gas colic or asthmatic colic or even impaction colics. Um, those are the horses that we really think along those lines of ruling out gastric ulcers, but also thinking about hindgut health as well and parasites and sand and, uh, you know, other things as well. So with that, we're bang on time. Um, we, unfortunately, we've lost Nat to wrap up, but I'll, I'll just go ahead and wrap up. I'd like to thank everyone for your attendance. Uh, it's, it's fabulous to see everyone come back for a second time. It's fabulous to see everyone hang out and um, stay for the Q&A. Um, I, I hope that there was new information in there for everyone. I hope there's some valuable information in there for everyone. And I'd uh, like to see everyone, hopefully, again in a couple of weeks when we talk about the hindgut. And in the meantime, I'd like to wish everyone all the best as you uh, hopefully we all start to get back to riding our horses out in public with uh, appropriate social distancing and social group and group size. But uh, hopefully we can all get back to, to doing what we love doing on weekends in, in the very near future. And thank you to Colato for, for giving us the opportunity to have these conversations and, and um, you know, have a chat and present some of my research and, and some of my ideas. So. Uh, thank you all, and we will see you hopefully in the next session in two weeks. Evening.